excited to be here. So uh, this film was literally made by a village, and uh, I'm the only one representing the village. So uh, I'm hoping that you will enjoy it, and afterwards uh, hang out so we can talk a little bit. I love to talk. Uh, in Sudan, we call it Wenesa, which is like this chatting is like the most important thing you can do. It's, it's like instead of watching football, because we don't have uh, electricity and running water, we gossip and we talk and we enjoy ourselves and uh, get into trouble. And that's what the film is about. That whether that's why you're here to watch it and hopefully talk about it afterwards. Um, and also, the film is, has a very serious backdrop, so we can you'll have a lot of questions, so we can talk about that too. So please enjoy enjoy the film and let's talk afterwards. Yes, and we will talk afterwards. Gossip and talk trouble. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we're going to uh, talk about your amazing movie. So thank you again. Um, Hope you guys enjoy it. Hope you guys enjoy it. So um, you, you're known before this for doing amazing documentaries. Um, can you talk a little bit about the footage at the beginning of your film, why you included it, and um, yeah, and how it kind of segues into your actual... Okay, so um, we, we do live in a war zone um, and these artists, amazing artists that uh, made you laugh and hopefully made you enjoy your time are actually living in the war zone. So the beginning, the footage is actually real. We just added the music to it because it, I mean, war is absurd. I mean, you watch war and like it should never happen. People should not kill themselves, especially from the same country. So when I so this footage we got, it was just like, this is so explains our war, it doesn't even make sense. So the way the guy just stood and the way he stood and everything to me was funny and explained how, how funny this could be, although it's dangerous. Um, so, so yeah, so part of the reason why we went from doing documentary to doing this was because uh, living in this war zone, I had this documentary, it was called Beat of the Antonov, and we went around in the villages and we showed the film, and the film was very intense, and explained the war, and showed the war, and showed death, and all that, but people, when they got together, they were excited, and they had a lot of celebration, and they were laughing at small little things. So watching them, I was like, oh, we need to create something uh, to make them happy. So we started creating short films and dramas during the rainy season where there was a break. And then we made this for our people to get together and laugh, but also to have a background of war and for us to remember this and pass it on to the next generations. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that uh, like I really appreciate about this movie is the comedy and the humor and just the humanity of it makes it so much easier to connect with a crisis like a civil war, right? Because, you know, our daily lives, we're running around, there's so many tragedies, so many horrible things, so this definitely allows people to kind of connect and be like, oh, I know the Sudanese civil war better now. Like, I know that people there are just like us. You know, they want to laugh, they want to cry, they want to, you know, have relationships or sneak into people's tents or whatever. Um, you know, uh, poor, poor, <laughs> But anyway, um, tell us a little bit about the group of people that you got involved in this project. How did how, what the community was like? Okay, so um, yeah, so there's the civil war going. Omar Bashir, the Islamic dicta military dictatorship of Sudan, is bombing us, and after committing genocide in Darfur, decided to jump on the people in Nuba Mountains and Blue Nile. So it's horrible. And then there's war. War is very intense. It has those moments where you're just running around and then suddenly the plane comes and is bombing you, so it's suddenly scary. But then there's these breaks of boring life where there's no development, nothing. All this youth are running around, can't really go to school. There's like two high schools in the whole area of half a million people. So there's a lot of downtime where you're just bored and you don't know what to do. And that's when we started the youth center. And the best part of the film is this process of becoming artists, of having a lot to create and wanting to live life to the fullest. And I think when life is unpromised, this is it's more exciting. So we, we just 
all got together and we're creating this art and it was just the most amazing thing to be able to create art in a process that is uh, so organic like we started we we didn't know what we were doing we started because we like wanted to do art and slowly it progressed until the point now we have all these artists who are amazing and who, who's the cast who yeah so the first person i ever casted was apsi uh, apsi the musician so i was somewhere in somebody's house uh, and we're hanging out and actually was drawing something on like a mural in the wall and I was like what is this guy doing here and um, so I was like ah let's, let's do some more art and we started the drama group and then Lena I was I was in a uh, Ikram Marcus is her real name I was in a um, marketplace and she just came up to me and she was just like this powerhouse and she was like talking to me and I was just like where, where, where are you from? And um, she's incredible. She's just, yeah. She's she's everything she is and more. Like she's trying still to go to school and trying to like uh, um, get educated. And uh, she was the makeup artist. She had a revolution against me. In the beginning, I was like, nobody. There's not going to be any makeup in the film. And then next thing I know, she's like doing makeup on one hand and on the other and designing people and getting other folks and she took over and I was like, okay, that's her. Um, speaking of Lena, uh, your film has a lot of amazingly strong female characters. Um, and then even just kind of, you know, the, the representation of women in your film and, you know, almost a, an affront to kind of toxic masculinity that, you know, when the men have to wear the women's clothing, it's, it's, it's not even done so much as a joke. Like, he's kind of fascinated by this new set of breasts that he has when he puts on the bra. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of making strong female characters and those messages? Yeah, that was, that was very important from the beginning, and also not having the film end with the male figure take, taking winning the female. It's just in the end, that's not what's going to happen. Um, and also playing with the gender fluidity that I think we already have, but then got really removed. So throughout the film, like Adnan is changing his clothes mm -hmm. until he's in his traditional clothing, which was worn basically by men and women, and how he just like wore it and like went with it. So there was a study in like that gender and fluidity going on. And it's amazing with the actors because after, you would think that as soon as they finish that, they'll take it off. They were just chilling. They were just <laughs> wearing them. And then I would be like, in the end, can you take it off? Because I have to put it away, because that's just this props. It's not what you do. Um, They were just, like super comfortable in it. And uh, it, it just, you know, going back to our roots, it's just like, ah, oh, you know what? This whole like yeah. gender thing came from one side. Cool. I have a million questions, but I'm sure you guys do too. Does anybody have any questions? You want to raise your hand? Yeah, over there. Well, maybe just a little about the. Uh, how, it looked really beautiful. So what did you shoot it on, and where did you edit? Like, did you edit in the Sudan, or did you come here for the editing? So, how did you edit, film it, the technical stuff? The technical stuff is amazing. There was this. Um, the beginning and the end of the film was shot on a small DSLR, the Sony A7S II which does amazing light so it's this amazing camera that came out and then our camera a was the fs7 and uh half the film was shot with a friend of mine uh, argentinian filmmaker living in new york and he for some crazy reason decided he wants to come and help us uh, he was part involved when we were doing editing also edits um, our documentary work trying to show the world what is happening in sudan and he wanted to come out, so he came and shot with us. Um, and what is the other question? The editing. Was it the editing. Yes. So when I started the edit, when we finished the film and we threw the party, that was the ending of the film. We were so tired. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. It was a very hard production. And we threw the party, and then I was so tired. I just disappeared for a month, doing nothing, hanging out, drinking barista, and walking around things. And, uh, my cousin is here, he's like, I don't drink. Um, <laughs> it didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, and, um, then I had to start editing, and we started, I was editing while I was there. So I was editing on a laptop. That's the amazing thing about nowadays. So I was just editing on my laptop while in Luba, while hanging out with everybody, and uh, later on, traveled the world while I was trying to finish the film. And who did the music for? 
Uh, Nancy, um, the, the music in the beginning and then, uh, her name is Nancy Munir. She's an amazing musician who's based in, uh, she's Egyptian. And basically what she did was like, she took it in the beginning, she's like, um, when you're done with the film, give it to me. And she actually played music to the, watching the film. And she's one of those crazy musicians wow. uh, who can play every single instrument in the world. And she was using like brushes and things and oh, random. Right sounds and whatnot and she she created the sound yeah it's the perfect accompaniment it's wonderful anybody else have any questions um yes can you um explain what lena meant when she said uh, go find yourself and then come back was that sort of a um, i'm here for you um no i think uh, it's whatever you got out of it <laughs> i feel like to me lena is the is like, to me, um, this is questioning revolution and why we fight. Because in the beginning, if you talk to me back in 2013, 2014, we were like super revolutionaries. And we thought we were going to take over Bashir, take him out, and using all this nonviolence and all these groups and different things. And we thought we were going to win Sudan and change it. And then a few years later, like the war is continuing and we're just continuing the struggle and whatnot. We kind of like still had the rhetoric, if you come and to ask us, but then we were just running around doing whatever we're doing. And I feel like Lena personifies somebody who actually really knows. And um, like I quoted a lot of other black revolutionaries, like uh, Coco Blues wears the red beret from Sankara, there's Fanon, Protect right. the Earth. Uh, Lena says, my pan is better than your weapon, which is referencing the Black Panthers with uh, uh, um, breakfast yeah. uh, program. So, so she to me is like the person who really knows. So to her, it's just like go and, and free yourself and come back. It's him, but it's more like all of us. It's just for us. Go on. Um, so one of the oh sorry yeah yes ma yeah. Um, could you say a little bit about the how you got the financing for the film together? Okay, so we, we did the documentary, Be So Antonov, which uh, aired on PBS. So we had some money, so we bought the camera, the small camera, and I went there, and, and I have a co-producer who's in South Africa. And I was like, oh, we're shooting this film. And I started shooting in November with no money, with whatever. And uh, he started panicking, so he rushed and applied to Doha Institute, and we got the first uh, part of the money. Uh, the whole film was 150000 so he got wow. the first part, and then World Cinema Fund funded a little bit, then AFAQ, um, Arab Fund for Arts or something, funded the rest. And we used like 50000 for color correct and audio mix, which I don't know why it's that expensive, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> the sound was amazing. Like being here in the big cinema, it's just like, okay, that, that was worth it. Yeah, it sounds like <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. So yeah. yeah. Uh, are there other questions in the audience? Um, Oh, yes. <laughs> you said there were all sorts of things that went wrong in the production. Was there any like particularly bad luck that you had, and was there any particularly good luck that you had? Good luck was uh, when the car got stuck in the sand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, while training the actors, it was like all like the whole, if I don't say cut, you stay in character. And they stayed in character. And I was wow. amazed, because like, this was amazing. So that was like good luck and good acting from them. Um, bad luck. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's called bad luck. It's, it's just like amazing, amazing people who just want to destroy your work. Um, so if you see the actors, they were like wearing hats for no reason. Yeah. When he went to play um, um, with the football, yeah. he just took the hat, which was amazing. But so I got into trouble with. Um, this guy who's like the secretary of information when we were there and we went overboard and they started this little war between us and he took my soldiers and, and took them to the army and he tricked the army into thinking saying that he's they're his so they cut their hair and then released them two days later saying sorry and so they didn't have any hair so we had to like figure out ways to cover the hair so after two days of crying, uh, we came up with, with ways. So for example, when Lena kicks him out of the hut, she throws stuff at him and it kind of lands on his hair, on his head. So films are not shot in order. So we had some stuff that was done, some stuff we had to come up with reasons. And yeah, it was like, we, so that was one thing. Um, and, and like, there's like 
a hundred others on the same level. For, for example, one last thing. Um, we, we had, uh, the stuff was put in a certain place and somebody broke into our prop area and they stole one of the machine guns. And then, you know, a machine gun, you get into trouble. Right. So we had the guy who lost the machine gun was one of the actors and he was like freaking out and I had to pay money to go to the medicine woman so she can somehow go like, do something to bring the medicine, to bring it back and I had to deal with that like two months after the filming I was still dealing with it. In the end, I actually like had to get somebody to smuggle a machine gun from the north without telling him and paid for it and I didn't tell him and I just went at night, like ran and gave it to him and like, I was just like, don't tell anybody. <laughs> These are the normal things of being a filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> smuggle a machine yeah, smuggle gun. Smuggle machine gun from the enemy. <laughs> yeah, no, no big deal. Um, I would love so much to continue this conversation, but we have to clear out for the next screening. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. And there's another screening. Uh, when is your next screening? Do you remember? Tomorrow at 9.30.